Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to the Augusta Baker Storytelling Experience, inclusion programming for children of all ages, otherwise known as AB Kids. I am Valerie Bird Fort. My pronouns are she, her. I'm an instructor for the School of Information Science at the University of South Carolina. I teach courses in children's literature, school libraries, and library programming, and I am so happy you're here. This series is named in honor of Augusta Braxton Baker, who was the first African-American coordinator of children's services in the New York Public Library system. She worked at New York Public Library for 37 years and then came to South Carolina where she served as the library school's storyteller in residence for 14 years. Some reminders before we get started, we are recording today's session. Make sure you're on mute unless you have a question or you've been asked to unmute yourself by the speaker. Leave your camera off or turn it on. It's really up to you. Feel free to participate in the chat. I'll be monitoring it during our, our presentation and use the reactions. Look for the smiley face at the bottom of your Zoom screen and show some love during the story time if you'd like to. As mentioned, today's program is part of a series. Please visit the AB Kids website to register for future sessions and to explore and register for all Baker programming. The link will be posted in the chat. Also, I'd like to share that today's session is from Miss Anne, who is in New Zealand. So it's actually 2 a.m. her time. So this is a recorded session, but it's still going to be wonderful. And we are so honored to have Miss Anne, who is part of the Storytime Solidarity Team, who is joining us. Yeah, we're so honored to have and I mean, it's an amazing team. I can't say enough wonderful things about each and every member of the Storytime Solidarity team. But Anne Koppel is um, a big reason that we get to call ourselves global because she is our lone representative of the Southern Hemisphere. So it's 2 a.m. for her. Um, and it makes scheduling meetings a little bit challenging, but we are so, so lucky to have Anne on the team. She um, does amazing work with children and she has all these wonderful subspecialties. She really takes the emotional lives of children seriously and does wonderful work helping children cope with difficult things. Anne is a delight and um, I think you're gonna love her all the way from Aotearoa. I think I said that right. I've been practicing. Anne has made it um, also part of her mission to keep the Maori language alive um, as a way of honoring the indigenous people of New Zealand. She's just kindness incarnate. And I think you're going to really enjoy her story time today. So I start my story time by singing a special song called Tēnā Koe, because in the Maori culture, they have a thing called a pōwhiri, which is and meetings which are hui and they always start with a karakia or a blessing and it puts you into a special space that's out of the normal space and at the end you have a similar karakia or blessing to take you out of that space and put you back into the normal world so just like every story time starts with an opening song and finishes with a closing song it's the same theory take you out of running around like little mad children and put you into story time listening mode and that's how I structure my story times and that's how I did it today because I want to acknowledge the Māori culture where I live. Thank you, kia ora. So if you're in a Māori situation like a poifiri or a hui or a meeting or a gathering, you introduce yourself using a pepiha often, which is like your whakapapa, your genealogy, or we, so people can connect to who you are and where you come from and your family history. So I've just used a little brief one at the beginning so everybody knows where I live, where I grew up, and what my name is. Our action is with a song, and clap your knees, clap your hands, and then tēnā koe, hello to one, tēnā koe, hello to two, tēnā koe, hello to all, hi my, welcome everyone. Tēnā koe, hello to one, tēnā koe, hello to two, tēnā koe, hello to two, Hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone. I know again. Hello, everyone. 
Then I called her, I had a love to do. Then I called her, I had a love to go. Why am I everyone? Welcome everyone. Then I called her, I called her. Now me, can I even own a whole if I? Ko Tamaki Makaoro te whenua tāpū, ki te ao awaroa e noho ana. Ko Anne Kopel tōku inua, te nā koutou katoa. Greetings to you all. My name is Anne and I live in Auckland and currently I work in Helen's Hall Library. So it's lovely to see you all. Now it can be really hard talking about hard topics or sad topics like death and being sad but these are effects of life and you never know when you'll have a discussion about them so it seems to be focus on always being okay if not happy right how are you i'm okay i'm happy so how do you admit that you're not okay that things are difficult for you today how often do you talk about your mental health and I know I don't often, and if I do, it's with a carefully selected group of people. But children need to know that it's okay to be sad, that they don't have to be happy all the time. And so-called negative feelings are just a fact of life. And if we talk about them, then children will learn coping mechanisms and appropriate language from an early age, which is so much healthier than bottling them up or pretending that you're okay. So the topic is too big for me to cover today. So I hope by sharing these titles, it will inspire you to find more books on the topic, that they're out there. The team of Storytime Solidarity have included many such books on our website. Because of the books and the stories I'm sharing today, I might get sad, I might cry, but that's okay. It's important to share those feelings. So the first book I'm sharing today it's the hug blanket. It's about a young girl and her relationship with her grandmother. I have a hug blanket. My mum crocheted it for me. I bought it in today. I sleep with it every night. And luckily, I still have my mum with me. So that's great. And she still crochets hug blankets. This time for children um, who need them. Like they might be in hospital or their new babies. And sometimes they're for older people who just need a bit of a hug blanket themselves while you're in a rest home. So, and today I'm wearing one of my dad's shirts. It was a special occasion shirt that he used to wear when I was little. So my dad died over 20 years ago and wearing his shirt and seeing it every day when we're hanging up at home helps me remember him. Not that I forget him, but it's something to see and touch when I really, really miss him. So... The Hug Blanket The Hug Blanket Written by Chris Gurney Illustrated by Lael Chisholm Published by Scholastic New Zealand 2020 Used with the permission of Scholastic New Zealand Can you see all the love hearts and the girls in the background and the beautiful blanket and the lovely squishy balls of yarn and the wonderful seashell necklace? Keep an eye on those. They'll be throughout the book. Now, the author, Chris, has dedicated the book to Olivia and Noah and their wonderful Nana B. And the illustrator, Lael, has dedicated the book and it says, For My Family. Nana lived at the beach. She wore colourful flowing skirts that flapped in the breeze when she waved to us. Nana had soft, wavy, white hair, which she let me tie up in bunches. Can you see there's an illustration on the wall about that? 
one of the paintings or pictures. She reads stories to us out of faded old books with crackly pages. She played make-believe games with us. Sometimes she put a white tablecloth over her head and pretended to be a ghost. I didn't know whether to scream or giggle. I loved helping Nana bake, make bread buns. Standing on a stool in her kitchen with her frilly apron around my waist, I'd roll st the sticky dough into long white worms before tying them into knots. As they grew fat and golden in the oven, the smell of freshly baked bread would spread through the house and make my mouth water. Oh, I can smell the bread that my mum used to make. Just like this, Nana. Last summer, my little brother Noah and I stayed with Nana. She came down to the beach to watch us swim and splash in the sea. We hunted for shells together and placed them carefully on each of the wooden steps that led from the beach to the house. Nana made hug blankets for all her family while she watched TV. Bright wooden, wooden squares grew through her fingers and were joined together to make something special for each special person she loved. My blanket had a shell stitched on every corner. I loved my Nana. One day, Dad told me that Nana had died suddenly. I didn't know what to do. Everything felt wrong. People said she'd gone to a better place. I wondered how she could go to a place that was better than here with me. Dad and Mum took Noah and me to Nana's house at the beach. The house felt lonely and strange without Nana. I was sure I could smell Nana's fresh bread in the kitchen. I sat in Nana's chair and rocked. I looked at Nana's basket of wool. We all went for a walk along the beach and gathered shells for Nana. Nana loved shells. The wind whipped around our ears and the waves raced up the sand to nip our toes. I ran on ahead, hunting for the biggest and best shells, lifting up brown clumps of seaweed to see if there were any hidden underneath. After our walk on the beach, we trod back up the wooden steps carrying our shells. I saw the other shells Noah, Nana, Noah and I had put there. On the day of Nana's funeral, there were lots of tears, but there was laughing and talking too. People told stories about how much Nana meant to them. Some of them made me feel sad, but some of them made me smile. Can you see she's wearing Nana's shell necklace? At the graveside, they lowered Nana's coffin into the ground. Then we each flew through a shell down on it. Noah chose the biggest shell and he threw it hard, so it made a loud clunk as it landed. Nana would have laughed. As we walked away, I looked back and waved and said, Goodbye, Nana. When we got home, I went to my room and pulled out all of the things Nana had made me. I put on my woolly hat that was a tiny bit small now, and the beautiful cardigan she had not long ago finished knitting me. My eyes grew leaky and my chest ached. Then I picked up my hug blanket. On cold evenings, I like to pull my blanket around my ears, and when I don't feel well, I tuck it under my chin. I hide under it when I'm unhappy. It smells like sunshine. It sounds like whispers. It looks like rainbows. It feels like love. A few months later, we went to Nana's gravesite again. I arranged some flowers and shells in front of her shiny new headstone. 
Noah drove his toy truck all over her headstone and then he decided to leave it there. The Nana. Does say, with love we remember on the gravestone with a little shell on it. We were learning to do cartwheels, so we showed her how good we were getting. She would have liked that. The flowers, the shells, the truck, and especially the cartwheels. I miss my Nana. I miss playing with her soft white hair and seeing the flash of her rainbow skirts. I miss her hugs and the sound of her voice. I miss all the things we used to do together. But Nana is still here inside me and will be forever. And when I snuggle under her hug blanket, it is as if I can feel her arms around me once again. The end. I'll read a lot of books about death, and so these are some that I would recommend as well. There is Daddy's Rainbow, which is by Lucy Rowland and Becky Cameron, and it's a long-term illness and eventual death of a father, and how that takes the colour out of his family's life. An Ordinary Day by Alana K. Arnold and Elizabeth Vukovic, which is about the circle of life with two houses side by side, one welcoming a new baby and one saying goodbye to a special old pet. And then The Funeral by Matt James, which is a children's view of a funeral. So it's a great of a great uncle that they're not particularly close to. So it's just like having a party, but with boring speeches. So it's really a good one to read with a child if they are about to attend a funeral. So that's one that I would recommend. I know lots of people won't have their own hug blankets or their equivalents. So the next story is about the importance of memories, traditions and connections with those who have gone before. You don't have to have physical things to remember somebody by. So the next book I'm sharing with you is very special. It's written by a teacher who lives in my town. The book was first written in Te Reo Māori, the Māori language, and that version has won many awards. This version has been nominated for many awards. So this version, the English language version, Te Reo Pākehā, has many Te Reo Māori words and concepts throughout it, and I don't want to interrupt the flow of the story by translating them, so I'll include translations in the subtitles. But I will tell you first of all that koru means granddad. The Matariki is a special sacred time of the year in Te Ao Māori, in the Māori world. And you can learn about more, it more on the Storytime Solidarity website. So, how my koru became a star. How my koru became a star, a Matariki tale. Written by Brianne Tipaa. Illustrated by Story Hemi Morehouse. Originally written in Te Reo Māori and published as Kua Fiturangitia Akoro, published by Huia Publishers 2022. The author Bray has dedicated this to my godson Adam, who loves his dolo. And that's because when Adam was little, he couldn't say koru. So that's what he said instead, koru dolo. The content from Matariki, the Star of the Year, which was published in 2017, and Te Tau Toro Nui of Matariki from 2021, by Rangi Matamua, was reproduced with the permission of Dr. Rangi Matamua and Living by the Stars. Before sunrise, one pupiri morning, with the moon in its tangaroa face, I sat with Koru on the manga. To the east we directed our gaze. He taught me about Matariki, guiding te waka arangi through the sky. He taught me the names of each star and to give thanks with an offer of kai. 
We made a hautapu in a pot with a lid, with a kumara, for tupu anuku. Added mussels just for waita, they'd be sure to please his puku. We prepared an eel for waiti and put that in the hautapu too. Tupu rangi would prefer kereru, but chicken would just have to do. Koru recited a karakia, then he called out my dear uncle's name. There were tears in his eyes as he spoke it. They fell down his cheeks without shame. I looked at Koru with his sad eyes as his tears continued to fall. Listen carefully, Emoko, he told me, to the most important tikanga of all. Te Wakaharangi has a captain by the name of Taro Mainuku. He captures the spirits of past loved ones and keeps them safe with him on his canoe. When Matariki appears before sunrise and the Tangaroa moon shines so bright, we call out the names of our loved ones. Taramainuku sends them into the night. So although it's hard and distressing, although it may well make you cry, we must call out the names of our loved ones so they become stars in the sky. I vowed to remember the lessons my koro had taught me that morning. Then sadly, the next pipiri, koro passed away without warning. I didn't have time to be sad though, as I anxiously looked at the moon. I had to get on and prepare things. The marama would be in Tangaroa soon. I started my tasks in the kitchen and there found the perfect size pot. Koro had taught me what stars like. I was determined to gather the lot. Mum, can I please have a kumara? She frowned and then raised a brow. I guess so, so she handed it over. Off you go, outside and play now. Hey Dad, I know that you're hungry. But please save some mussels for me. He gave me a look of confusion, then reluctantly handed me three. Tuakana, can you please come with me? I need help with catching an eel. Okay, he said with a frown, but that looks like a very strange meal. Tuahine, please can you help me? I need chicken to go in here too. She handed me some from the fridge, then asked, Is everything okay with you? I think so, I said a bit worried, but there's something I still need to do. Will you come with me up the monga before sunrise to get a good view? Sorry, Itama, said my sister. That's too early. I'll still be in bed. But it's already... Kore kore whakapiri, I'll ask my tuakana instead. Bro, will you take me at the manga? I asked, as I started to feel quite sad. Kao itama, don't be hoha, he said. Okay then, I'll go ask my dad. I'm going to climb the manga before sunrise. I'd love you to come. I'm a little bit busy, itama, dad said. How about you go speak to your mum? Disheartened, I went to my mother, my face all creased up in a frown. If you won't take me up the manga, I said, I'll probably let Koro down. Mum looked at me strangely and said in reply, Itama, I don't understand. I explained what Koro had taught me, the matariki rituals I'd planned. Firstly, we cook all this kai, making sure that we keep on the lid. Then we let out the steam and feed all the stars. At least, that's what Koro and I did. But actually, Mum, I finished. The most important tikanga by far is to call Koro's name to Puhutukawa so Taro Mainuku can make him a star. By now, my whole whāna had gathered and I knew from the tears in their eyes that we'd all be climbing the monga to see Matariki in the wakening sky. 
When we arrived at the top of the monga, we lifted the lid off our kai. The steam is to feed Matariki, I said, and give thanks to the year that's gone by. Before sunrise at Pupiri morning, with the Tangaroa Amua a moon above, we called out Koru's name to the stars and farewelled him with all of our love. We cried and we laughed, sharing memories, played his favourite songs on guitar. It made us so sad to call out his name, but that's how my koru became a star. And we have an end note. Thank you to Rangu Matamua for his sharing your knowledge of Matariki, without which the story would not exist. Thank you to my parents, David and Lottie, my constant encouragers. Thank you to my grandmothers, who are a part of everything I write. Thank you to my grandfathers, who were both stars long before I was born. I have other recommended picture books about the death of a grandparent and continuing on with their lessons or the traditions they've taught. One of them is Grandma's Glo Gloves by Cecil Castellucci and Julia Denos. And that's about a little girl who spends time with her grandmother in the garden. Her grandmother has dementia and soon dies. So she still misses her grandmother and spends time doing the things that they did together. Also, Dadaji's Paintbrush by Rashmi Sudesh Pandey and Ruchi Mishane, which is about a little boy who copes with the death of his grandfather, Dadaji, by locking everything away. But a small child reminds him of their shared past and helps him rediscover his Dadaji and his memories and his joy. If All the World Were by Joseph Kolho and Alison Kolpois. It's a simple story of a young girl and her granddad. With a, there's a lot of the book deals with the immediate aftermath of the death, like tidying up and finding treasures and all the wishful thinking and the reminiscing. My granddad leaves her a legacy, a new remote book and an emotional one too. My culture really doesn't have traditions equivalent to calling out your loved one's name so they could become a star but you could make your own rituals. On my dad's birthday, and the anniversary of his death, we like to eat his favorite food for dinner, baked beans on toast, and then we have his favorite chocolate for dessert, which is his peanut slabs. On the day my cat Molly died, I found some knitting wool that looked and felt just like her, fluffy and gray, and so I made a little scarf out of it. The Molly scarf lives curled up on her chair, just like she did. And I'm going to make a scarf out of wool that's very similar to my cat Jenny who died a few months ago. And so they can sit together on a chair and when we miss them we can pat them just like we did the cats. So the next story is about being sad or depressed, but not for any reason. In this book, sadness is represented by a blue elephant. It looks at how you might be told to fix it but how difficult that can be. But every day, the elephant becomes less heavy and the child is able to do more things. So, my elephant is blue. My elephant is blue, written by Melinda Schmanick, illustrated by Vasanti Onka, published by Penguin Random House New Zealand, 2021. My Elephant is Blue, a book about big, heavy feelings. One morning, I woke to find an elephant sitting on my chest. I found it hard to get up or move around, to breathe or talk. I'm Blue, the elephant said. Can you move please, Blue? I asked. I don't want to move. This is a good spot for me to sit. You're crushing me, I said. 
Yet I find you very comfortable, said Blue. Mum and Dad were worried. They said, perhaps if you cheered up a bit or smiled at it. But it's hard to cheer up or smile with an elephant sitting in your chest. Can you see the windows in the background? It looks quite cold and wintry, doesn't it? My brother said, well, that's different. I said, I don't want to be different. At least, not like this. Maybe if I helped you push, my sister suggested. She leaned against Blue while I shoved. Even together we weren't strong enough. It's an elephant, I said. It's an elephant, Mum and Dad said. Surely it can't stay forever. It's bound to move on sometime. I hoped sometime was soon. Mum took every book on elephants out of the library and started reading. Wow, look, can you see the book titles? Sad elephants for dummies. Horton, here's a blue who? Blue elephant strategy, elephant jokes, volume one. The elephant's rant, how to move an elephant. Wow, what's that one? Oh, Ellie's pants are blue. The elephant is blue, elephant psychology. Dad rang an elephant specialist someone had recommended. It might help if you ate something, Mum said. I'm not hungry. It was true. Not even for chocolate? I thought about this, but shook my head. Not even for chocolate. I'll keep it here until you are hungry, she said. Dad said, Exercise and fresh air never hurt. I was tired of staying around the house all the time. I wanted to go for a walk, but it was impossible to walk with an elephant on my chest. I want to go for a walk, I said to Blue. Can you move? Look, it's a little bit like, like spring in the background. Can you see? Humph, <laughs> Blue replied, turning her back on me. Was she crying? Would you like to come for a walk with me? I tried. We can go together. Blew out by putting two feet on the ground and we managed to walk around the block. Look, maybe it's a little bit like spring. Can you see some leaves on the trees, some colour? That walk was nice, Blue said the next day. Would you like to go on another one? I asked. Maybe. This time we walked around the block and in the other direction. Some people said hello to us and smiled. We both smiled back. It would have been rude not to. That looks much more like spring or even summer, doesn't it? A lot brighter and warmer. The next day, Dad said, let's all go for a walk. As I put on my shoes, I asked Blue, are you hungry? No, Blue said, at least not yet. Mum's packing a picnic. What are your favourite things to eat? What can you see on the table? What is Mum packing away? We went to the park because elephants like to eat grass and bark. We had sandwiches and pie and the chocolate Mum had saved and some grapes and apples which Blue and I shared. Blue put all four feet on the ground to reach the grass. Doesn't that look like a lovely summery day? She munched for ages and then we lay down side by side. The sun shone and the fresh air blew gently on our faces. I felt lighter than I had for a long time. My sister and I played roly-poly while Blue watched. Then all of us played football. Look, can you see them both smiling? And on the way home, Blue walked beside me and her trunk held my hand. I noticed something had changed. Blue, I said, you're turning pink. That's because I don't feel so blue anymore, she said. Blue still lives with us. I take her for walks and we share our favourite things to keep her in the pink. And although sometimes she is blue again, I've discovered she has lots of other colours.
Yellow is the one we love the best. Doesn't that make you happy and smiley? Look, swimming and ice cream, fabulous. Can you see who they've dedicated it to? Melinda's dedicated it to her friends who help keep her in the pink. And Vasanti's dedicated the book to her sister who shoes the blues away. And it also says, if you or someone in your family ever has a visit from blue or is struggling with low mood, it's important to see your family doctor. There are some other picture books about sadness and depression that I recommend. There's one called In the Blue, which is about a dad with depression and the impact that has on his family. A Blue Kind of a Day, which is about an, another little person suffering from depression and how it makes the whole body feel affected, like you've got a cold sometimes. And it's not just sadness. And there's one called My Giant Seashell, which is about a mum and a daughter, and the mum has depression, and sometimes it's really hard, and it's like the mum's vanishing. You might have heard depression described as the black dog, and that metaphor's been around for centuries. The blue elephant is much more child-friendly, but it's the same feeling. It shows how depression doesn't always feel like a part of you, that it's an external thing that you, you just don't need just cheering up that, or going for a walk, get some fresh air, feel the grass. Depression is harder to deal with and to manage and that sometimes it feels out of your control. But just as the child found in My Elephant is Blue, with care, time and love, you can come out of this smothering feeling. Sometimes treatment, including counselling and medication, is necessary. And that's how I deal with my depression. So, but thank you all for listening, for letting me share some books that are special to me. And take care, all of you, and I'll see you again. And to say goodbye, to end, probably we'll sing the Kakepe Ano song, which is pretty simple. So if you had, say Kakepe Ano, I'll see you again. Kaki te, kaki te, kaki te ano. I'll see you, I'll see you, I'll see you again. Kaki te ano. Na mihi nui. That was such a special story time and so important to share those big feelings with children and let them know that all feelings are okay. Um, we're not always happy all the time and that's okay. Thank you so much for being here today and please join us for the rest of our sessions. We'll be back next Tuesday. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.